Inside this room, all of my dreams become realities, and some of my realities become dreams. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Alive, it's alive, it's alive! You are listening to The Wilder Ride, getting wilder by the minute. Here are your hosts, Alan Sanders and Walt Murray. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Wilder Ride, where we are getting wilder by the minute, a podcast that celebrates the films of Gene Wilder one minute at a time. And we're in the midst of season two, and we are diving into Blazing Saddles one, put it there, baby, minute at a time. I'm your host, I'm Alan Sanders. I am your co-host, Walt Murray. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome for the very first time to our podcast, Tierney Steele. Tierney, welcome. Hello. (laughs) Great to have you joining us here on this I know you've been doing uh, your own podcasts as well in the Movies by Minutes format. I think you've uh, been Return to Oz, The Neverending Minute, The Mash Minute, Joe versus the Minute. I mean, you you like doing this. Yeah, I uh, I keep doing two at a time, which I love them all, but is a mistake. Just in case anyone was looking for life advice, don't do two daily podcasts at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. No, that's crazy. So, yeah. Do you have help editing or do you do all that as well? So uh, I am editing MASH and Joe versus the Minute. Um, right now, I we haven't started recording Joe versus the Minute, so I'm doing OK. I'm keeping my head above water. But um, yeah, when I was on Return to Oz Minute and Never Ending Minute, that was my first podcasting. I, I think I guessed it on one because I knew I was going to be doing them. And I didn't do any of the editing. I my co-host on Return to Oz Minute, Mike Carlucci, is a computer. You know, I'm not worthy. Please just fix this person that I go to in my life. <laughs> and then um, Thomas Howard from The NeverEnding Story literally works with audiological equipment as his job every day. So I benefited greatly from being able to rely on them. That's fantastic. And we had yeah. Thomas actually as an earlier guest this season, and he's a he's a fun guy to have on the show as well. Oh, great. Yeah, I was trying to remember because I when you guys started this, I was like, what a great idea. Instead of following a single franchise, follow the actor, you know, director, whatever, you know, like, oh, what a cool idea. And I was just like, oh, it's too late. You've already got your guests lined up. Never mind. I'm good here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I I don't even know where it kind of hit, but sort of out of nowhere, I just realized I've always been a Gene Wilder fan. Walt's always been a Gene Wilder fan. And we thought, Mm -hmm. you know what? He doesn't really have a franchise, but he's got such an eclectic body of work that so many people love. Why not just dive into an actor's uh, portfolio? (laughs) What order have you guys or is this like a surprise that I shouldn't be asking you on the air? But um, what, what how did you determine the order you guys are covering things in? It's a wild just, ass guess as we wrap up. All each right, season. I love it. <laughs> yeah, we just we put a put a few out on the table and then we arm wrestle over which ones. So uh, gotcha. So I've lost both of those. <laughs> no, you yeah. did not. You won season one. <laughs> well, and that was kind of an easy one. That was almost fish in a barrel because <laughs> Young Frankenstein is such a uh, a great film, and you know if you talk to anybody who grew up in the eighties that's going to be one of their top favorite films. So so that one made a lot of sense for us to start with. My sister is a 90s baby, and we, a couple years ago, we were coming up with, you know, what are the three, five, whatever, however long you've got to kill, uh, movies that someone has to see that your family is going to quote so often and so out of context that if this person hangs out with you guys and has not seen these movies, they are going to be so confused. And Young Frankenstein was in there, and she was, like, aghast that I had not suggested it already. She was horrified. Yeah. We were just like, all right. Anytime someone starts being part of the family, it's like, sit down. So there's this movie called Arthur. You're going to watch it, because otherwise we're going to talk about (laughs) fish bathing together, and you are going to be so lost. And then I... I my sister, she literally, she's like, you got to put Young Frankenstein on there. I'm like, do we really quote it that much? And she just looked at me and she goes, and then she just started singing roll, roll, roll in the hay with the accent. And I was just like, all right, all right. It's, it's on the list. Yeah. <laughs> Point, set, match. Yeah. Blazing Saddles 
wasn't as much. Like, it was one that the grown-ups knew and loved, but that they weren't always showing the kids as much. <laughs> well, it, different, a, a different tone. A young Frankenstein, definitely a little safer. It's a yeah. retelling or sort of a parody of the original Frankenstein story. Blazing Saddles as a satire trying to address racism is a completely different level of storytelling. Yes, and I had it I, I actually the next minute, but 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 uh, this performance by Madeline Kahn is definitely one of my like not earliest memories ever, but like a very early memory of seeing it and getting like not quite getting what like like getting that it was funny and thinking it was funny because I mean look at these guys it's funny but not really getting why the grown-ups loved it so much <laughs> so let's go ahead and then and then get the discussion underway then since it's a Tuesday here we had a guest yesterday that sort of kept over for the weekend uh, we had Megan Bailey who was helping us discuss this song and dance number with Lily von Stupp so today this uh, this edition we're actually going to start with the drunk man or the drunk cowboy coming up on the stage with put her there, baby. And we're going to end with bust your balloons. <laughs> so Tierney, before we dive into the minute, we do this with every first time guest with the movie. You were talking about, you know, Young Frankenstein was one of those movies you saw maybe a little bit more. You, you The adults were the ones kind of quoting Blazing Saddles. Yeah. At what point did you really start to understand some of the uh, more adult layers to Blazing Saddles. I would have watched it in high school a couple times. And then, I, see, I was a huge Mel Brooks fan. But Blazing Saddles, for reasons you've mentioned, it's not on TV as often. And and if you're a Star Wars obsessed geek, it, you're going to put on space balls more often. If you, um, like me, decide that Anne Bancroft is the greatest thing that's ever happened, you're going to put on to be or not to be more often, which, yeah, I got notes about that because I love it. Um, <laughs> it. It's really weird. Like, I had definitely seen it in high school, and I, it was a Mel Brooks movie and one of them, but we were always putting on other Mel Brooks movies. Like, like we were putting um, uh, in college, the huge one was History of the World Part One. My friends and I were obsessed with that movie. I, I think Blazing Saddles maybe got put on once, but we all knew it. It was it was part of the cult. Like you could quote it, you could reference it and people weren't like confused. But I don't know when that happened. Yeah, that's that's kind of interesting because Blazing Saddles for me, um, probably from high school on, was something that I watched at least once a year for quite a while. And uh, around my circle of friends, it was always a popular one. And I've probably seen History of the World three or four times. And, you know, again, I mean, just like you were saying, if somebody references it or, you know, quotes a line of it, everybody knows what it is. But it wasn't as big uh, for me and my circle of friends. So, but it is it is funny how Mel Brooks is a common thread through for so much of us. Yeah. So many of us. It, it really, and I think because he made movies that you could watch with your kids, you know, older kids, obviously, but you could put that on and there was stuff in there that was going to make the kids laugh and there was stuff in there that they weren't going to get. And that was okay. It didn't ruin the movie for anyone in either direction. Yeah. One of the things I said to our previous guest is it reminds me of the storytelling, certainly more adult, but the storytelling you used to have in the old Muppet show, where there was humor that the <laughs> yeah. kids got at the kid level, the very basic, simple, usually a lot of the visual gags. But then all of a sudden you go back and you rewatch as an adult and you go, oh my oh my goodness, there's there's a subtext here that I never picked up on as a kid. Yeah. Oh, I I have like a one of those visceral memories, like I can picture exactly where I was and what I was bearing and sitting there when I realized it's from history of the world part one, what Madeline Kahn was doing when she sings, <laughs> nope, 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 nope. Yes. Yes. Nope. Nope. Yeah. Like I had seen that movie my entire life growing up. My grandmother loved Mel Brooks and she was a huge movies person. So I had seen that so many times and I grew up, love Madeline, <laughs> like Madeline Kahn. And like that moment where you're sitting there, I, it must have, it was 13 or 14. I can't remember which. And all of a sudden you're like, Oh, 
It's the light bulb going on over your head, and it, and with Mel Brooks, it's the it's so bright it probably blew up. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. like oh my god. <laughs> so yeah, but I think that's that's an awesome quality of at least this era of comedy. I would argue that some of his later movies became too much of hitting you over the head from the very mm-hmm. beginning, where some of these earlier movies had some of that subtlety and the subtext and multiple layers that. It sometimes took multiple rewatchings and all of a sudden you go, oh, oh my God, how did I not get that? Yeah, well, that's why I love doing these movies by minutes things, because there are things where it's like, oh, yeah, I've seen that movie a bunch of times. And it's like, I I didn't even notice that that character existed. And now they're my favorite person. <laughs> well, that hasn't happened at all with these movies, right? Where we pick up on something. <laughs> uh, oh, no. <laughs> no, I haven't learned anything. Well, we, we have discovered we have been either misquoting a line or mishearing a line or not even realize what the person was supposedly actually saying. It's been awesome diving into this one minute oh at a time. Oh my gosh. And this is a great introduction for me. Like, I'm, you know, well, so I missed the weekend, but that's all right because what a way to kick off the minute. Like, her absolute I don't give a shit face as he falls off the stage is is perfect. It It brought me so much joy in my in my female identifying heart of <laughs> just like, <laughs> as he's always just like, this guy, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, let's read, okay, for your benefit, and we'll remind the audience, mm-hmm. if you watch very carefully, the guy's mouth does not match precisely the ADR. The voice of this drunk guy is actually Mel Brooks. Did you know that? I don't think I knew that. I'm trying to like, I'm like listening in my head, like replaying the minute. Yeah, we ended last uh, episode with him saying, oh, Miss Lily, oh, my baby, oh, my <laughs> pussy cat. Yeah. But then we start today with. Put it there, baby, put it there. <laughs> <laughs> and he falls off into the audience. That is Mel Brooks voicing the drunk coming up on stage to think he's going to have his way with uh, Lily. But it's quite obvious Lily has done this once or twice before. Oh, yes. She just remembers to sing for other people who have seen Miss Congeniality. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. I love the fact that <laughs> Madeline Kahn, here's this rough and tumble, you know, drunk cowboy coming up on the stage mm-hmm. thinking, I've got this petite, small woman who's in the middle of a performance dressed in this lingerie. She's mine. And she just like lets him approach yeah. and knows exactly what she's going to do. Yeah. She's not phased by it. And, and like you said, cause this isn't her first time doing this. Like if he, if he gets on the stage, you know, maybe if I play along, he'll, Oh no. He, all right. Well now I know what I got to do. And it's just, like I said, it's the, the blaseness Is that a word with which she does it? That really makes it so great. Yeah, if you pause right at five seconds into this particular minute we're looking at, as the guy is doing a uh, timber off the stage, her look is like, eh, yeah. no problem. <laughs> this happens. It's fine. It's going to keep going. <laughs> well, and it, and it's such a victory moment, too, because it's what you want to have happen to every drunk jackass you find in a bar. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And, and so it's kind of like not just her comeuppance, but everybody's comeuppance. Yeah, you know, there's always going to be that that one idiot who th- gets a little too drunk and thinks mm-hmm. that they can do whatever they want. And uh, Tierney, let me ask you this. Have you ever had to deal with <laughs> the, the <laughs> drunk coming on to you? Uh, yes, but not as bad as, not as blatant as this. I actually was just thinking, I, even if it's not malicious, um, I listen to a podcast on Buffy the Vampire Slayer and they have meetups where they actually host a prom in honor of, you know, Buffy. The prom is very important at the end of season one and in the movie. Um, They had a dance and one of the people who attended was posting like someone got way too drunk and came up and asked me to take a photo three times because she kept forgetting that we'd already taken a photo together. (laughs) And then she said, she's like, you know, I felt kind of bad you know, I had such a wonderful night. I'm not like trying to complain about drunk people at this. Like this was a great event and people are wonderful. This person had just had too much to drink. So even if it's not malicious, you can still be an obnoxious drunk. Now you add his 
intentions and his assumptions about her. And it just, it pushes it to that next level where it's like, okay, everyone can be obnoxious when they have too much to drink. Oh, and you're an ass. Like, great, cool, (laughs) good combo. Get off the stage. (laughs) Um, And she handles it so just wonderfully. Just like, it's no big deal. It it really is. And it reminds, so I, um, I was just doing like plays in high school. I never had to pull any drunks off stage, but I remember in my very first performance that I ever stage managed, I realized I was on the wrong side of the stage. So I just like real quick ran across before the curtains opened and everything. And afterwards, the director said, she's like, I almost had a heart attack when I saw you running. And she said to me in 1999, and I still live by this day, like, never run. It doesn't matter how fast you're walking. You do not run unless, like, there is an actual emergency. And so that, there have been times where it's like, all right, you know you got to keep the calm. You know, don't run. Just Walk as fast, do what you need to do, but do not run. And I feel like Lily kind of embodies that of like, I'm not upset. This is something that happens. Here's how I'm going to deal with it. And then I'm going to move on with my song. <laughs> like, Yeah. It's almost like she's really tired. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I walked she's right tired of playing this game. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and when she does start singing, you can see she's sort of looking down where he must have crashed into the front row of the other cowboys. We don't hear anything. We're not hearing you seeing anybody getting upset. She just kind of like nods her head and goes, there you go. I'm going to keep singing. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. It's fabulous. It's absolutely fabulous. And then she misses her mark and still keeps going. Like, Oh, I love but, it. Uh, right at second it's, 12. It's, it's, there's something, again, about having been a stage manager and having directed where it's just like, yes, you go girl. You keep singing the song and find that to lean against. Good job. <laughs> I, I want to know. And, and the only way we will ever know is if we were to have Mel Brooks come on, <laughs> did he intentionally let this one keep rolling and she just went with it until he said cut and he liked it. Or was it a oh. plan that she's still so bad? I mean, she's a performer, but she's not the greatest singer in the world. And the song she's doing isn't exactly the greatest song in the world, but it's funny to watch her perform and to miss the mark and go to put her hand up on the, on that lattice work, almost Mm -hmm. the, the, the decorative, uh, I know what you call that, the the decorative railing. Yeah. Uh, It's great because she never misses a beat. Yeah. I think that was planned because she kind of overdoes the miss. And so I think I'm, I'm going to guess, but I think that was. Planned. I don't know. You'll be surprised what you can do when you're in a, quote, live performance and you realize until someone says cut, you don't get to stop the action. You just keep going. And I remember being in a in a show before and one of my guys, it was a uh, Macbeth and the guy just completely forgot all of his lines for us to exit the stage. Now, you have to exit the stage. You've got the army. You're marching on the, you know. You're, you're going to go steal the, sh- the shrubs of Burnham because you're going to be like this camouflaged army assaulting Macbeth's castle. But the guy completely blanked. I'm like, well, we got to get off stage. And I, I channeled my inner, th- my inner Thundercats and I went, army forward, ho! And I got us off stage. It was the most ridiculous non-Shakespearean line ever. <laughs> but you just go with it. You can't mm-hmm. just stop. I And it could be a, one thing that I run into talking about MASH, which the movie is directed by Robert Altman. And everyone talks about how wonderful it is and how much was improvised and spur of the moment. And he really just let people go. And then when you talk about the uh, talk to people who were actually filming with him, it wasn't loosey goosey. Yes, they were given a lot of opportunity to ad lib. And I I think it was Rene Abajois was like, that all happened before he started rolling. Like, once you were actually rolling, you did this. You know, you might come up with ideas then. But once you are actually filming the scene and and, um, and Mesh, there's that famous thing where they're all lined up at a table and it looks like the Last Supper. Oh, yeah. what a funny thing. And and the actors are like, yeah, we showed up and that and he said, that's what we're doing. But it shows he had someone go and get him an art book with that picture so that he could line it up exactly like there are things that are meant to look like 
wow, that just happened. What a wonderful coincidence. And it's not like there is that possible thought process put into it. And there's also, I wanted to mention, because of course I read up on Madeline Kahn, because I begged you guys, that's why I wanted to be on the show. Um, And because she was a trained opera singer, it reminded me of, I saw, I think it was a Canadian ballet company, but now I'm blanking on it. They did Alice in Wonderland and the Queen of Hearts does a solo. And the whole point is how terrible she is. And what I realized watching that with my aunt was, you have to be so good to act that bad. Right. If that makes that like, like you need to be a very good performer to play Lily Von Stupp and make it work. Like I, I could see it being, you know, maybe that's something that happened in rehearsals and it made everyone laugh. And Mel Brooks was like, oh, my God, do that. So then this one is planned. <laughs> yeah, I also think, uh, and we've talked about this, is she had to force herself to keep hitting those flat notes and they'd have multiple takes because it was hard to sing off key once you've been trained as well as she had been. Yeah. To, to, uh, it reminds me, Yeah, you know, you talk about having to, how hard it is to act badly if you have to be also good in the same movie. <laughs> and I think every time I see or I've seen Boogie Nights and I watch how Julianne Moore when she's on the quote unquote porn set she's horrible like she's your typical brainless porn actress and yet she's a wonderful actress and worthy of the Academy Award you know it's it's hard to act bad and act good at the same time Mm -hmm. and that's that's why I love this performance I mean not just because Again, it was one of those little thrills, like, I'm a grown-up now, I get it. You know what she's talking about? Because I do, because I'm, like, grown-up now. Um, (laughs) (laughs) There's always a part of that 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 stays with me. Um, Although I'm kind of horrified that in all the times, and this is a total Movies by Minutes thing, I never noticed the band. Really? That's right there. I don't know how. Like, I just... It never occurred to me to notice that at her feet are people playing musical instruments. I, I was the same way until we started going through this. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen this movie. And I think Alan actually mentioned it a few, you know, a couple minutes back. And I was like, wait a minute, there's a band. Oh Because he said something about the orchestra pit. <laughs> and, and I was like, orchestra pit? What are you talking about? And I went back and watched it. I was like. I'm breaking this thing down a minute at a time, and I didn't notice four guys with instruments and bowler hats sitting there <laughs> playing it. Yeah, it's playing the bowler the hats that really make it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it goes to show you, Mad- Madeline Kahn owns every second of screen time so much, you don't pay attention to the fringes of the of the scene. You're watching dead center because she's right there and captivates everyone's attention. So I wrote down who these guys were because I felt very bad because I was pretty sure that no one has ever given any thought to the four dancers behind her. (laughs) I'm glad you've got that. Which is an exaggeration, obviously. You know, uh, before you you give Um, us those four guys, Walt, when I watched this the first time as a kid, I went, what? What the hell? We've got four guys in Kaiser helmets coming out here doing sort of a half-ass song and dance number. I just was laughing so hard. I don't know that I heard any of the lyrics for the first the first few times I saw this scene because it was so unexpected to have all these guys come flying on the stage and add a dance number to this to this bit. <laughs> I think this was the first time that I kind of went, yeah, Mel Brooks is insane <laughs> <laughs> because this is this is just so out of place and. Um, and, and nobody would think about this unless they were breaking it down a minute at a time. But are these local talent guys who show up in that same garb every time or do they travel with her? Like, what are these guys? No, I'm guessing and, based on the fact that they know the blocking, the, yeah. the, the, the guy that we see that for us, the first guy closest to Madeline Kahn, which would be the guy closest to stage right, knows to grab a chair for her, knows mm-hmm. they all four know to throw their rifles behind them to catch her later uh, we're going to get to that later this week. So mm-hmm. I think these are part of her traveling group of performers. I think they have to be because they. It, this is not an easy dance either when you start paying attention to it. 
Uh, it is a pretty complex and well choreographed dance. Oh, you just made my day saying that. Because one of my notes is that this looks like choreogra- choreography I'd have come up with. <laughs> <laughs> so, See, Walt has never I, actually been in a musical, so he's easily impressed. Oh, oh, you just, that was beautiful. I'm just going to take a moment to bask in it. Um, well, and I've hardly even watched musicals other than the Blues Brothers. So uh, for, for me to notice this, this, is, this has to be pretty good. the guns while walk, and that was when I was like, oh my God. Because I, um... I I did stage managing in high school and a uh, little bit college. And so I worked at a summer camp and we had drama production, which is two weeks of 45 minutes a day to put on a musical for the camp. So you can imagine oh, wow. the amount of uh, Broadway quality we're getting here. And actually, I shouldn't say that because we had some every so often there'd be a kid who was just like ridiculously talented and it's like. Let me just shove you out on the stage. Go do your thing. Um, but <laughs> every so often you would end up with, and I, I did the sets. I did set design and I helped out. And so every so often Linda would just be like, Tierney, can you choreograph? Um, I did uh, in Annie, easy street. And I don't need anything but you because there's only a couple people in those. I can't dance myself, <laughs> but somehow I was supposed to tell three people how to perform Easy Street, which thank God I was friends with Caroline, who's playing Rooster, and she knew how to do the hat flip thing, and that featured prominently because it's like thank God. Yeah, Don't leverage do that. <laughs> leverage everybody's individual talents they bring and make it look like you came up with it. Exactly. Um, Annie and uh, Daddy Warbucks is great because you can do a lot of stuff with chairs and her jumping up on the chair to be as tall as him. Cool. We're good here. <laughs> but yeah, when they're doing that, when they flip their hands and then just walk back the other and like, oh my God, it looks like I was told, like, just come up with something for them to do. Like they're just switching sides and changing places with each other. And that's fine. <laughs> Well, and at one point, the second guy has his gun upside down where the other guys have them right side up. And I just thought it was kind of funny that, you know, if they were really looking for perfection, they'd have cut, redone it, but they just let it roll, yeah. kept on going. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, where um, do you see a guy with his gun upside down? Uh, at minute 57. Oh, toward the end of the song. Okay. Yeah. Um. You'll see it when because they they do actually go through. Oh, and you're the you're the rifle perfectionist guy. Uh, okay, here it is at right at min, uh, second twenty eight twenty nine. Uh, let's see. Actually, yeah, twenty nine. You can see the other the two guys on the far right have theirs right side up, and the other guy has his upside down, and the and the fourth guy's getting the chair. Oh, when he's when they're doing the little shuffle back and yeah, forth. The, yeah, the little shuffle. Okay. It's upside down. So not yes. coming in off his shoulder because they all had it you correctly know what? off their shoulder. I see what you mean because when he puts it down, yeah, he flip he flips it while yeah, they're wh- doing wh- their shuffle thing. Exactly right when it's at he's, waist level. Yeah, because I'm paused on second thirty and it's flat like parallel to the ground. Right. Okay, so but then as soon as they continue it. the move, yeah, they're all and, back and to normal. And you can see the action is actually facing down. Okay, I see what you're okay. Before we get into too much of the song and dance, <laughs> let's go to Tierney because she said she had uh, a rundown of all of these uh, dance men that we want to give them a little bit of credit. Yes, but I don't know who is who, so we can decide for ourselves. I have Ray. Oh no, why are people French? Chabot. Why are people French? <laughs> why are people French? <laughs> Those Frenchmen. No, I just I I know. A way to say that that I probably just made a lot of people very sad by <laughs> saying it. Um, Alfred DeCio, Bert May, and Alan Peterson are our four guys. And the only thing that I picked up on clicking into their uh, biographies, which were all quite short, is that Alfred Peterson was also in Xanadu, which I know has come up on Movies by Minutes things before. <laughs> well, That's kind of a litmus test of what people can stand. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um. And did you notice, wait, and I'm sorry, which one, you're talking about Alfred De Silva? No, you're talking about, sorry. Alfred DeCio, Burt May, Alan Peterson, and Ray Cha Bo. <laughs> <laughs> 
Chabot. Yes. <laughs> okay, so, and then Burt May was in a bunch of stuff. He had 27 credits, but did you notice that most of his credits, he's a dancer? Well, I guess so. <laughs> like in, in Bye Bye Birdie, he was the dancing Shriner. Um, in, let's see, so let's run through these real quick. Born to Sing... Uh well, he, gosh, he was in uh, Ziegfeld. Ziegfeld, I'm totally killing that one. Isn't that the one with uh, Lucille Ball? Was mm-hmm. in? Yeah, I believe it the was. Lucille Ball yep. is, mm-hmm. that she lost her eyebrows. Yeah, I think so. And then like Easter Parade, Words and Music. Um, Nancy goes to Rio. He was a chorus boy. Summer Stock. He was a dancer. So he's he basically played a dancer in just about everything he was in. Yeah. But, I mean, hey, that's not a bad career. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. There's a movie called Lil Abner that he was in in 1959. He yeah. was credited. Well, he wasn't. He was actually uncredited. But they have him as Dog Patcher. Do you think that means Dog Catcher and they just screwed it up? Or was there something called a Dog Patcher at some Yeah, point? I don't know enough about Lil Abner other than <laughs> it comes up in crossword puzzles all the time. So <laughs> I can't. I can't really speak on that one. <laughs> Yeah, and then he, let's see, so if you move on, he was in Hello, Dolly, as the dancing waiter. Um, and then... I that one either. <laughs> at Long, Lo- uh, Long Last Love, he was the primitive man dancer. And um, then he in 78, his last credit was California Sweet. He was a waiter. But most of his stuff, he was actually a dancer. So he must have been pretty talented. Maybe he made this up and I shouldn't have uh, <laughs> pointed out... <laughs> Any of its shortcomings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well I think that's he, why he's dead, my, I think, so he I think that's care. why my family liked Mel Brooks movies so much, is because they really, they're comical, musical, like, they're, I'm, I'm saying this badly, because a lot of those classic musicals are also comedies, you know, they're Danny Kaye and stuff like that, and this is almost kind of the reverse of it. Like, they're comedies, but there's always going to be at least a couple musical numbers. Yeah, and, you know, I didn't really appreciate the musical numbers for a long, long time. I'm I'm not a real musical person. I mean, I, I like music, but um, I really didn't even appreciate this song or this whole segment, really, of the, of the movie uh, for a long time. It probably wasn't until four or five years ago that I actually started paying close attention to this scene. I have a uh, startling confession to make next minute. <laughs> <laughs> when the song ends. Okay. Let's move on to the next minute then. Well, no, we don't. We, hold, 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 we got this what's called a tease. We need because we want people to come yeah. back tomorrow. Also, so we get a hold we're, back. We're not going to end this minute without um, giving some a moment to sit and appreciate the line. They start with Byron and Shelley, then jump on your belly and bust your balloons. <laughs> Oh, we got to get to that before, even before then, I want to point out yet another little behind the scenes note. The guy that's closest to Madeline Kahn, Mr. Chair, we don't know which actor of the four you've mentioned, Tierney, but the guy who gets the chair, the one who has all the extra lines, the where he he yells. That's all Mel Brooks. Also, he voiced every bit of the voiceover for that guy. I thought that yeah, was his I, voice. I, I honestly thought it was him too. But, 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 um, guys, when does this movie take place? Well, it's 1874 in the movie. It came out so, 1974. How do people get off the phone in 1874? Well, they wouldn't. <laughs> Oh, Mel. Oh, Melly, Melly, Melly. Yeah, see, there are a couple of these things that really destroy the whole movie for me, and that's another one. Well, it's ruined. Pack it in. You guys had a good run. (laughs) Yep, I'm done. Yep. Here we stop at minute 57. That's it, folks. Oh, no, wait. We've got to stop at minute 58, because I've got to hear this confession. (laughs) Yes, we can't can't not make it till tomorrow. I mean, we've got to get to hump day at least, okay? There we go. Yeah, we'll do, um, we'll do one so more. So anyway, for the audience, if they've seen this movie, which I had hundreds and hundreds of times, had no idea Mel Brooks did that voiceover as well. 
uh, and does a really good job in the ADR matching it up because it's really mm-hmm. hard to see any mismatches of the mouth movement. It's, it's really well done. It's almost more of you can recognize that that is Mel Brooks' voice and you look at the person and you're staring and they're like, but that's not him. You know, it's the opposite of how you usually can tell something has been ADR'd. <laughs> right. And you can really tell because when the music stops on the line, don't you know she's pooped? It's 100%. If, you, if you're now, yeah. if you now that I've told you, you go back and listen, you're like, oh, how did I miss? That's Mel Brooks. Yeah. I, I, I always thought that was, was his voice. Because, again, I, at first I thought it was him. And it makes sense. And then I was like, wait, no, that, that can't be. So, um, but yeah. And, and then I just got distracted being really sad because I feel like given a lot of the things that I like in life, I should like the romantic poets more. And I just don't. Really? So, even starting with Byron and Shelley. And I was like, oh no, but like Virginia Woolf's flesh is such a great book. And I'm like, that's the Brownings. Like, I mean, there's just not, uh, <sighs> Byron and Shelley, I just, the whole floppy hair, everyone has syphilis, we're in love with love, and I'm just not, not feeling the romantic poets era at all. <laughs> so the fact that they get name dropped here, and I was like, and jump on your belly and bust your balloon. I'm like, yeah, all right. You and me, Lily. Well, you know, I. There is actually one of Shelley's poems that I really do like. It's the one that goes, there once was a man from Nantucket. (laughs) No, that's not him. (laughs) Oh, that's not Shelley? Oh. hmm. No. (laughs) People make that mistake all the time. Don't worry. uh, Oh, my Lord. There are amazing poems by all these people. And, like, the fact that Mary Shelley was able to make Frankenstein do that, like, there's some great stuff there. There's just... have to understand i was an english minor and i knew english major boys that tried and it was just like no like all these people are disease racked and treating each other terribly like they're writing very pretty words but no <laughs> like please do not use them as your idol that's bad yeah no <laughs> no definitely not well it's kind of like point out figures. something for uh, Lord Byron, since that's the first, he mm-hmm. goes Byron and Shelley. So yep. Byron, obviously a, a, a huge body of work, but I think the one that's most important and, and maybe the 74 audience, depending on their classic education, might have known this. I know I, as an English minor in, high, in, uh, in college, mm-hmm. uh, Don Juan was considered one of his biggest and most important works. It was an opus that spanned 17 cantos and is considered one of the most important long poems ever published in English since John Milton's Paradise Lost. And ironic that Don Juan gets the, you know, we all know that Don Juan is the guy who seduced, a, you know, a thousand women, mm-hmm. that we would know that Byron being quoted here as his biggest work was about a guy who used to seduce women, and here's Madeline Kahn so- singing a song about being seduced yeah. or being with men. Yeah. So there's a, there's a little bit of a tie-in right there. Hiring. <laughs> and uh we know uh percy shelley uh walt you know there's a there's a tie in here right because you know his his wife well second wife was mary shelley author of frankenstein oh right and i think uh percy shelley is probably most known for ozymandias mm. which was a great a, episode a, a, a of sonnet. Bad. ozymandias uh, which, for our friends who are doing the uh, the Watchmen minute, that's the name of one of the uh, uh, one of the heroes in there, Ozymandias. That's a good name for a dog. <laughs> uh, for folks who don't know his most famous poem, uh, Ozymandias, I had to actually have this memorized when I was uh, I did a combination of English and I also was a communications performance minor, uh, so I actually did a lot of communications. Our, our college didn't have a theater department at the time I went. It was part of the communications department. So I did a lot of the performance and communication classes at the same time. And it's a fantastic poem. Uh, It it goes, I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell 
that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear, My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare. The lone and level sands stretch far away. There we go. It is, in fact, a sonnet written in iambic pentameter and follows in the Shakespearean style. So now, th- th- I told you, I-, I told you both, we actually start to do this and we have to, like, dumb it down at the end to make people not, like, not freak out. All right. Well, I mean, I said it was a good name for a dog. I referenced Breaking Bad. Uh, I was going to say, that, that episode of Breaking Bad was <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so we've got our tie-in, Walt, that his uh, second wife helped us uh, write or, or help write the, the story that would give the next movie, the one we did for season one, Young Frankenstein, its chance. No, she she wrote it. Yeah, it's all hers. It's hers. Damn it. And uh, this poem, <laughs> Ozzy Mandy, as I still love, because it's always about no matter how great you think your works are, no matter how great your buildings or your accomplishments, at some point, everything just disappears into the lone and level sands of the desert. So once again, we've got an analogy. Everybody would have probably known, or if you're even somewhat schooled, yeah. uh, that Ozymandias is about, you know, the end or the, the everything comes to a completion, to an end. Whether she's tired or everything below the waistline is kaput, which we'll get tomorrow, um, it's another illusion there from, the, from one of his works. So I love the Byron and Shelley and then jump on your belly and bust your balloons. It's a great way to end this. <laughs> and come to p- completion. <laughs> oh boy Walt did I lose you are you like asleep (laughs) (laughs) oh who me no (laughs) I I always uh, love hearing classic poetry in my podcasts (laughs) in your Mel Brooks often quotes the line from Firefly I wasn't I wasn't uh, gifted with an abundance of learning (laughs) well I was going to say my my other uh, favorite Ozzy related uh, Ozzy Osbourne uh, Crazy, but that's how it goes. <laughs> Maybe it's not too late to learn how to love and Aww. forget how to hate. Oh, <laughs> nicely, and that done. really ties in with this movie because it it just shows how stupid it is to hate people for no reason. So thank you. There we go. I'm here all week. Ozzy, take a ball, <laughs> both of you. A lot of people didn't know that Ozzy Osbourne was yeah, uh, his first name. Actually, was Ozzy Mandiaz. <laughs> well, Osbourne is the English translation. <laughs> all right. Before we start to wrap up then this uh, this minute, because the song does continue into tomorrow, it looks like we're about to see all of uh, the guys behind her. They've all lined up their rifles, and it looks like they're aiming to, for, for the ceiling, so we'll have to wait and see what happens tomorrow. Um, before we wrap this minute up, Tierney, you are our guest. Do you have any other notes for this minute that we didn't cover that we want to cover now? Uh, no, we're good. Uh, and that went to a performance place that I was not expecting. So I love it. (laughs) Walt, what about you? Uh, the only thing I was going to mention, uh, these guys costumes are pretty interesting, but the helmet particularly. Oh, next minute. (laughs) (laughs) I think we're being told to hold off. So folks, (laughs) you have to come back tomorrow for two teasers now what kind of helmet that is and of course there is some sort of a startling confession that's coming so i just wanted to tease you for tomorrow excellent well you've gone through all of my notes i wanted to do a little bit of that poem i i thought lord byron and percy bish shelley deserved a little bit of a of a cultural treatment here on the wilder ride but that's all i've got so folks we want you all to come back tomorrow but before i set the stage of what's still to come Tierney, tell our listeners where they can find out a little bit more about you and maybe some of the shows you're working on. Ooh, uh, the best place to find me is on Twitter or Instagram. I am One Steel Sister, O N E S T E E L E S I S T E R. And I am on Facebook lurking around a bunch of different Movies by Minutes podcast groups. So you can find out a lot about me. Possibly more than you wanted to know (laughs) at any of those places. And my uh, Twitter bio has links to all the shows that I've co-hosted. 
which is a ridiculous statement to make. I now that I've said it out loud, um, <laughs> it has links to all four shows there. Great. Well, where can people learn a little bit more about the Wilder Ride? Well, you probably want to jump over to facebook.com slash the Wilder Ride. And then from there, join our listeners group by clicking the button to the side. Uh, you'll be asked to answer a couple of real quick questions just to make sure that you are actually a living, breathing human being who wants to join our group. And uh, from there, we've got all kinds of conversations going on and all kinds of fun stuff to check out. And come back tomorrow. It's Hump Day, Igor's favorite day of the week, where we start off with the uh, dancers all lined up behind Madeline Kahn, behind Lily von Stupp, all shooting their guns in the air. And we end with Sheriff Bart saying, I must see you alone in my... And I don't know who he's talking to or what about. So you're going to have to come back tomorrow, not just for the revelations of Tierney Steel, but to find out what happens in minute number. Oh, shit. In minute number 58 of this, The Wilder Ride. Man, we, we really went off the rails on a crazy train there, didn't we? But that's how it goes. You know, millions of people tuned in, or, or tens of listeners, but... And now they're living as foes. Yeah. And they're all. <laughs> I don't see how long this Maybe goes. <laughs> it's not too late to learn how to love and forget how to hate. And hit the subscribe button and listen and give us five stars. <laughs> In the immortal world. And a comment, <laughs> please. Yeah. Like and subscribe. <laughs> All right. Well, Tierney, I'm glad you're able to join us for this, and I'm glad you were able to uh, accept another minute. Uh, yes, I can fix my chair, so I'm actually facing my microphone. That'd probably be helpful for you guys, huh? That's awesome. <laughs> After we've kind of done the close, and that has thrown some people off the last couple times. So I, like, I thought we were done. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, am I supposed to say anything? So I just thought I'd let you know that before we started. Just hang out. <laughs> yeah, and if you feel like jumping in and saying something, you can. If not, you know, that's fine. Okay. okay. Yeah, this is all normally right. Walt and I reconfirming to all of our audience members. We're not anywhere close to smart, and, and we don't want anybody <laughs> to mistake us for that. If they don't figure that out in the previous 35 or 40 minutes, Aww. you know, every now and then we really throw people with some knowledge. And then I feel like we have to reset the table back to one, you know, <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> Do you guys swear on your podcast? Or? Yes. Okay. Her. No. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> So, yeah, when he takes it off his shoulder, he must have, like, kind of over-rotated it. I, I think that's exactly what he did. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, now that we've got that figured out and i got to cut all this crap to make it actually flow. <laughs> <laughs> you are a far better editor than I am, sir. <laughs>